Right. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Adrian Wong. I'm a consultant in London and King's College Hospital, and I am joined by a man that needs no introduction already, uh, Professor Mervyn Singer. But we will introduce him anyway. So the formal blurb which I have been given, Professor Mervyn Singer is a a professor of intensive care medicine at University College London, UK. His primary research interests are sepsis, multi-organ failure, infection, shock, and hemodynamic monitoring. Uh, his other interesting points of note, developed an esophageal Doppler hemodynamic monitor, developed the UCL Ventura CPAP device to support the breathing of COVID-19 patients. He is also the chair of the Sepsis Tree Definition International Task Force, so a range of interests. However, he describes himself as he tries on challenging, usually poorly evidenced dogma in intensive care medicine. So welcome, Mervyn. Thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, so I think given we'll get questions uh, sent in, so if you have any questions, Professor Singer, please send them in via ESICM TV. Now, um, let's, well, it's given what we are currently going through, I think it'll be fair to say that we've got to start with a COVID question. And as a researcher then, your thoughts on the research that's been happening around COVID-19, treatment, management strategies, so on and so forth. What do people think? What do you think? What do I think? Um, I'll, I'll give some praise um, and then I'll give some, um, I think, healthy, constructive criticism. I think the praise is that, yes, it is a remarkable achievement that, you know, so many patients were enrolled into trials to try and actually untangle what to do in COVID. So there's the praise. Things were got up and running quickly. Lots of patients were enrolled. The downside is I think we will, we are already regretting and we'll carry on regretting that I think we rushed in too quickly. Um, we rushed in without understanding the pathophysiology. So, you know, cytokine storm was thrown around, mm -hmm. yet we know that most patients have normal or even mildly raised levels of cytokines. Very few have raised high levels of cytokines. So just throwing a cytokine blocker, immunomodulator at these patients, to me didn't make sense when even from Wuhan, we were getting data early on saying, hey, you don't have a cytokine storm. And we published um, last November, so I think we wrote the paper in June or July, at the time on clinicaltrials.gov, there were 150 different targets um, which were being trialed, 150, some against the host, antivirals, remdesivir, et cetera, but the majority were against the host response. And again, no rationale launching into big trials without any good reason. And then when you look at the trials themselves, they um, generally are nearly all truncated at 21 days or 28 mm -hmm. days. So we don't know what happened to the patients thereafter. They were done open rather than in a blinded manner. And there are lots of studies coming through showing evidence of bias because you're aware of what's being given. We didn't collect blood samples to understand subset differences. There were lots of crossovers you know, from one limb, randomized to one limb, but they were put into the other limb by the clinician. Again, lots and lots of questions. And, you know, unfortunately now, you know, there are more and more monoclonal antibodies and other treatments coming through. How, what do we do? Do we give two, three, four, five immunomodulators to one patient? Wouldn't it be better to know what we're doing and target the right patient to get the right treatment? I think, you know, it's fair to say, and we've learned over the years that some people will benefit from an intervention, if it's appropriate, will cause harm in other patients. And clearly, why don't we just focus on the ones who will benefit? That's my opinion. I com completely agree with you. It's one, and we were chatting offline and thought that COVID research and the management of COVID patients in the last 18 months or so, it seems like the wild, wild mess of West of medicine. Um, the intention has always been to help the patients. So what is your uh, advice to colleagues on the shop floor who says, well, I must do something because, you know, if not, these patients are going to die. I have to do something. Yeah. Something's better than nothing, isn't it? Yeah. 
I, I think that that's the sort of visceral instinct that we have. We we felt we had to do something, even though, you know, arguably it was inappropriate or even injurious. And again, just like in critical illness, if a patient is on the very brink, the likelihood is that any intervention you do will be a, a sort of Lazarus cure is very unlikely. So I think what we need to do is, again, learn the lessons of multiple decades of trials in sepsis that have failed is we need to be more considered we need to look at subsets and phenotypes collect blood samples to better understand responses positive and negative you know so let's do it properly you know you can make perhaps an argument that right at the very beginning in spring 2020 there was a rush but hey even after the end of the first wave we could have drawn back and said okay let's now plan a bit better, do things in the time-honoured fashion, as you say, you know, rather than reinvent the wheel, let's do the things, the basics we know and do them well. Okay, I don't, I don't want to spend a whole of our 30 minutes together talking about just COVID um, because, well, life must move on. So let's talk about your other passion in life, which is sort of sepsis, to say that you think. That. So, game changes in terms of publication in the last five years in the world of sepsis research then? Good question. Um, I think, you know, we haven't yet got to the, the big uh, killer drug that will um, save every life. And I, I think being realistic, we're not going to, because I think we all accept that many patients with sepsis have an underlying comorbidity, you know, terminal illness, that you know, infections the last point of travel before they go to a better place. So I think we've got to accept that there's only a limited effect we'll get in many of these patients. That being said, you know, I'm biased, but I think sepsis three has uh, made a contribution because, again, wild wild west. Your analogy to COVID beforehand, there were lots and lots of different definitions of sepsis, septic shock, and mm -hmm. The sepsis two definitions, which had followed sepsis one, didn't give a specific, this is what we mean by organ failure. And so it was left to different groups to decide what they meant by sepsis, what they meant by septic shock. So as a result, you got a research trials. So there was a nice paper from the Netherlands in intensive care medicine, where they looked at the mortality in the placebo groups of trials. And it varied from about 17% to about 80%. Now, clearly, you know, units aren't either that good or that bad. It's the patients that are different, yet they were all labeled, tagged as having septic shock. So I think what we've tried to do with sepsis three, and you know, hand on heart, it's not the final answer, it can't be, but is to try and get people talking in a consistent, standardized ma manner. So when I compare my unit with your unit or enter people into a trial, we're talking the same language so we can be consistent in coding and epidemiology. It can be used for trial stratification, et cetera. Um, I, I think the other area which excites me is, again, a lot of what we treat are syndromes rather than specific conditions. Sex okay. is a syndrome, acute kidney injury, a syndrome, ARDS, a syndrome. And within that, we've realized that there are lots of different subtypes. And whether you call them subphenotypes, endotypes, doesn't matter. But we've learned that clinically, biologically, these parent patients vary and mortality varies. And probably as being shown now, at least retrospectively, the response to different therapies also varies. So rather than badging, you know, one size fits all to every septic patient, I think we're learning we've got to be smarter and use biomarkers, so-called theranostics, to say, right, Adrian Wong should get a treatment because he fits the bill and Mervyn Singer, who's equally septic, shouldn't get it because he doesn't fit the bill. And then we know how much to dose Adrian Wong by and when to stop giving the drug. So we need to be able to optimize timing, dosing, and duration of treatment. And, and I think we're learning that and we will get better. I'm gonna pick you up on a couple of points and you've raised several interesting points there. So let's go back to the, the 
um, diagnosing sepsis by better defining it. So I'm, I'm microbiology colleagues around the UK and indeed around the world that everyone comes into the ED now with a label of differential diagnosis or even or the diagnosis of sepsis. And they are automatically given the thing I know you're very passionate about is, as well as antibiotics. Yeah. So because the definition has been made in inverted commas easier, do you think therefore antibiotics are dished out far too easily, not just at the ED shop floor, but later on in their, their pathway and journey in the hospital? Yeah. Antibiotic no. management done. Yeah, no, completely agree. Um, when, when I'm on call, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the residents and the trainees know um, they've got to ring me at night before an antibiotic's given, you know, because you know, and I don't mind being woken up because at the end of the day, you know, it makes them think, do I really need to give an antibiotic to this patient? You know, and clearly if they've gone off very badly, you know, I want to know about it anyway. And a lot of the time, you know, as you say, they've got inflammation, but it doesn't mean they've got infection. And does it mean they've got a bacterial infection or a viral infection or something else? Does it mean that you can just take an infected line out rather than poisoning them with an antibiotic. So all of these questions I think are really valid and we throw around antibiotics far too liberally and we see the overt consequences, increasing resistance, you know, the rashes of kidney problems, etc. But there are lots and lots of covert harm signals that we don't see, effects on the microbiome, effects on mitochondria, effects on immune function, etc cetera, etc cetera. and so we're helping some people but i think poisoning others and again if you look at the studies about 30 to 50 percent of patients labeled as being infected turn out not to have infection or only mm -hmm. a small possibility so i think and you'll see it certainly um american um society position statements from the infectious disease society of america the american college of emergency physicians i'm hoping that the uk will put out guidelines in which will reflect that i've heard but i haven't seen the surviving sepsis latest version but yes if the patient's very ill and deteriorating quickly jump just like somebody bleeding to death you're not going to wait four hours before you make a decision mm -hmm. however if they're not that bad they're a bit anemic, but they're hemodynamically stable. You don't need to rush in with O negative blood. You can make exactly the same argument and the literature backs that up. You don't need to rush in with an antibiotic because there's no evidence that the, the first couple of hours makes any difference whatsoever. So you can then decide, do they need an antibiotic? Can I do some more tests to see, is there a, a likelihood of a, a bacterial infection? And so, armed with that information, you can make a more um, sort of rational therapeutic decision rather than just blunderbuss, you know, shoot everybody down with antibiotics. And, um, and I think, again, the technology is coming through that we can get point of care testing. And I think in the next five, 10 years, it, it will be pretty well established. Again, there's a cost issue. And hopefully, uh, you know, people have got to be able to afford these tests. But hopefully if they're used well and there's a lot of fairly cheap technologies that I think, again, we need to just use clinical expertise along with guidance to, you know, do the best for our patients. And, and I think, you know, again, the literature, I think, supports me and backs me up. And I think people are realising that perhaps we've gone too far by being too aggressive with antibiotics. Okay, we've got a couple of questions now slowly coming in. They're on, I'm going to try and group them into themes for you. Um, on the subject of sepsis, we talked about antibiotics already. Let's talk about um, hemodynamics then. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about hemodynamic monitoring. So if you had one, your choice of a cardiac output monitor one, which yeah. one would it be and why? Okay, well, declaration of interest. Um, so. In, in my youth, um, so I, I developed a, an esophageal Doppler monitor, so I, I have to declare bias. Um, I think my answer to that question is, know the device, know the limitations of that device. And it might be problems with the methodology of the device, or it might be the device doesn't suit the patient at that particular time. So for example, yeah, 
I, I think the dilution techniques are okay, but they won't work if you've got a lot of tricuspid regurgitation. So if the patient has pulmonary hypertension, they've got bad ARDS, they will have uh, pulmonary hypertension, ergo they'll have tricuspid regurgitation. So a dilution technique won't work. Pulse contour techniques on their own. The assumption is that they track the volume, but they don't if the compliance of the circulation changes. So in a nice, quiet, resting patient, you know, five litres a minute, mm -hmm. yet the machine will say five litres per minute. But if the compliance changes, if you give or add or increase or decrease the dose of noradrenaline, that mm -hmm. relationship doesn't hold. And so you need to recalibrate. So again, you've got to be aware of the technology, mm -hmm. the good and the bad and the limitations. So, you know, I'm obviously a fan of Doppler, but again, there are some patients in whom, you know, aortic regurgitation, it doesn't work. It's good as a diagnostic tool for aortic regurg, because you can actually see it, but it's mm -hmm. not good as a monitor of output. Okay, pushing further. So most of these cardiac output monitors will look at things at a macro circulation perspective. There seems to be a lot more interest in the micro circulation at this moment in time. Your thoughts on that? Is that should we yeah. be targeting the microcirculation more rather than the macro circulation? Um, my answer is no, for two reasons. A, mm -hmm. we don't understand it, number one. Um, mm -hmm. And the, the problem is, again, it's chicken and egg. Is the microcirculation the problem or is it just responding to downstream demand? So essentially, the, the whole purpose of the circulation is to feed the organs and the cells. And so if the cells are saying, I don't need any more oxygen, leave me alone, then the microcirculation switches off. It narrows to not flood those organs who don't want to be oxygen toxic. So you can make a, a good teleological argument that actually it may actually be protective in some circumstances. So we don't understand. And there have been, unfortunately, very few trials where people have tried to modify the microcirculation in the hope of improving outcome. And the trials that have happened have either failed or actually shown a worse outcome. So my argument is, yes, we need to study it. Ideally, we need reliable real-time monitors so we mm -hmm. can measure it you know, you don't want to have to measure it and then go away and spend 15 minutes analysing. You want to get real-time data. And then we need the studies to know, right, how should we manipulate it? Good or bad? Should we leave it alone or whatever? You know, I think there was a lovely study from a group in Italy years ago where they looked at patients who went septic and looked at them in the recovery phase. And basically what they found was uh, metabolism was improving in the recovery phase and then the microcirculation followed afterwards so again this chicken and egg sort of question is the microcirculation following on from a downstream event i.e the tissue saying give me more oxygen or leave me alone or is it the microcirculation dictating uh, the course of events okay a uh, question from the audience then in terms of microcirculation and I suspect I know your answer to this already, but I'm duty bound to ask it. Vitamin C in oh, sepsis, COVID. Um, That's a singer? Yeah. Um, you are live on air. I'm live on air. Yeah. Again, very uh, well hyped um, on social media. Um, the trials so far are disappointing and, dare I say, it, predictably disappointing. Um, so, you know, I think, yes, it's a trial that's worth doing. You know, unfortunately, I think the way it was driven was, oh, it's safe, it's easy, it's cheap, everyone should have it. And a bit like COVID, you know, as you were talking about earlier, you know, patients got given hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and ivermectin, and we don't mm -hmm. actually know, A, do they work? B, what harm do they cause? You know, so even in inverted commas, non-toxic drugs, have the propensity to cause harm. So yeah, let's do the trials, properly conducted double blind trials and do it properly. So if you passionately believe vitamin C works, do the trial in a proper manner and you know, prove or disprove it. 
That's very diplomatically put. <laughs> I am for very all, for all, for, for all for all the calls on things we don't know and things we are unsure about that requires more studies. If you had an infinite pot of money and you had not just national UK support, but international support, what trial would it be to answer a question in sepsis or indeed intensive care? What trial would it be? Um, I would, the trial, I, I think one of the major deficiencies, I think at the moment is we haven't got a clue what we're doing with antibiotics. And if you look at the studies that have been done, um, we give one size fits all. So you'll mm -hmm. give the same dose to a 50 kilo person as you would to a 90 kilo person. Now, and then we don't monitor anything about, are we giving the right dose? And the studies out there showing some people who get the same dose, you're under dosing relative to a, an MIC measured in a Petri mm -hmm. dish in a lab. And in other patients, you are overdosing them. So that means, hang on a minute, are we properly treating some people? Are we under treating others? Yet we haven't got a clue what we're doing. You know, we measure once a day amino glycoside levels for toxicity. But again, do we know these concentrations? And again, we're measuring a blood concentration, but the bugs aren't in the blood, even bacteremia, there are tiny numbers of bacteria in blood and I mean tiny, the mm -hmm. infections in the tissue. So do we know that the antibiotic we're measuring in the blood is actually getting to the pneumonic consolidation or the peritonitis? So to my mind, if we had the technology to better know what we're doing with antibiotics, we'll know, again, one size doesn't fit all. Some people may need more, some people may need less. And so we can work out, are we actually doing the right thing for that individual patient. I hear microbiologists rejoicing around the world, but to push you on that point, are you talking about, let's say, is it, it sounds like a series of studies that you're already thinking about and ruminating in your head, but would the first step be moving practice towards um, therapeutic drug monitoring or monitoring, say, taser syndrome, mycin, all, all the usual drugs we dish out on intensive care and in the hospital, monitoring their levels? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think we also have to ask the question is blood monitoring we're, we're playing mm. here um, in animal models but we're looking at tissue monitoring with microdialysis and there are other technologies that could be applied also but i would think hey wouldn't it be really nice to know that what we're measuring in the blood actually relates to what's happening at the tissue level and you know as i mentioned before there are so many things that change you know antibiotics many of them are protein bound uh, have either renal and or liver excretion, uh, volumes of distribution change, all of these questions. So we know happen in sick patients, but we haven't got a clue that the patient in front of us is getting an appropriate amount. So, so I think, you know, we, we just blithely assume, yeah, we give, you know, a gram of this or 600 milligrams of that, but is it the right dose? And it seems a bit fundamental that we try and monitor everything else but here we're just empirically guessing and hoping for the best made a passionate uh speech on trying to personalize care to the patient that's in front of you that particular person so let's move that this conversation on to the whole personalized versus protocolized management strategies on the intensive care or indeed hospital in general, and that sort of leads on from the whole surviving sepsis campaign, so on and so forth. So from what you're saying, are you are you on the personalized camp versus the protocolized camp? In the middle. Um, some, and, oh, you can't be on the in the middle, well, sitting uh, on the me, fence. Let me justify it, let me justify it. Uh, Go on, the the guru of, of evidence-based medicine was a guy called David Sackett. He was a Canadian. So, you know, he, he was the godfather, as it were. And uh, again, a brilliant piece he wrote in the British Medical Journal in 1996, from memory, uh, basically said, you can't use evidence on its own. You've got to merge evidence with clinical expertise because that evidence may be inapplicable to or inappropriate for that individual patient. And as he said, you, we, clinicians shouldn't be tyrannized by evidence. So you've got to use the best available evidence, but take it in the context of the patient in front of you. 
So I'm not saying you should get rid of evidence. On the contrary, you've got to use it, but apply it appropriately. And protocols, to my mind, are too rigid. You have to do it this way or else you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. Wrong guidelines. So you can say, look, the evidence suggests that this is an appropriate way to manage this sort of patient. But you can rationalize with your experience whether or not in that type of patient that intervention, that guideline is appropriate or not. So that's why I'm sitting on the fence. I'm not saying just do what you think. You've got to know the evidence, but you've got to contextualize it. A declaration of interest when I was training, I was firmly on the protocolized group because I, my argument had always been that it ensured good quality care 24 seven, regardless of which clinician is on as I age and see more and treat more patients. I'm starting to shift towards that personalized side of things. But in the back of my mind, that protocolized area is continuously screaming out. Are people personalizing it to the patient or personalizing it to the clinicians? Because one of the dangers or trouble of evidence-based medicines is that we all interpret it many ways of one another of the same paper. Mm-hmm. Personalized to the patient, personalized to the physician. Yeah, oh, very good question. You know, we tend to believe the evidence that suits our bias. Correct. Um, which again can be dangerous. So it may be good, but it can be dangerous. Um, I I think my argument is, and I I tell, you know, when I'm doing a ward round, you know, I might have a a different view on life, uh, which goes contrary to a protocol. But then, you know, I tell the the juniors on the ward round, challenge me. If you don't understand what I'm doing or you think I might be wrong, get me to explain my rationale. And if you think you've got a better rationale, come back at me, you know, so don't be scared be forthright say oh this is a load of rubbish or haven't you read the paper or haven't you thought about this and it's up to me to be able to say well here's the literature and one says one one says the other and you know I I think as a a sad indictment but uh, you know I I was brought up in the era where you learned physiology well I didn't learn it as a medical student but I learned it subsequently and and then biochemistry and I love them and now it's sort of being weaned out of the system. And so, you know, people are just following blindly sort of brainstem reflex, um, a protocol without actually thinking about the physiology, the biochemistry, the pharmacology. And you think, well, actually for this patient, this drug would suit them better because their physiology says this, or the biochemistry says that. So, you know, just pouring saline into a patient when the chloride is going up and up and up doesn't seem very appropriate to me but saline's a great drug if the chloride isn't elevated relative to the sodium so again it's combining you know what the evidence base says with you know your understanding of bedside basics we've already close to the end of time but i'm going to close off by another question that been sent in which is um you you describe yourself as tries on challenging poorly evidenced dogma dogma license then if you had to re-educate all our listeners indeed the critical care fraternity which dogma you know entrenched in critical care practice would you challenge or change Oh, God, Uh, there's a whole I've got a list probably about that long, Um, you know, um, the way we manage diabetic ketoacidosis, the way we give fluid. um, Do we need to give, um, you know, um, prophylactic anticoagulation or PPIs to everyone? Um, The way we correct sodium levels if they're hyponatremic. If you again, read the literature and you'll actually think one, pick one, pick one. Oh, and challenge everyone to read literature on a subject. Okay. Um, diabetic ketoacidosis. How's that for a one where, again, I don't know guidelines in other countries, but the UK guideline is drown the patient with a huge amount of saline um, and give them too high a dose of insulin. So and try and do so by monitoring ketones. So a the patients get sodium overload and get a hyperchloremic acidosis. The doctor doesn't recognize it's iatrogenic, so it gives even more saline and makes them worse. 
they drop the sugar too quickly um, and then they run into problems because they're monitoring the ketones for which there's zero evidence of benefit when at the end of the day, you just want to bring things down gradually. So again, you know, why are we doing this? It's all dogma and there's zero evidence to support this, which is quite scary that we're taught at our mother's knee, this is the way to manage the patient. So again, my argument is look at the patient, ask, do they need fluid? How much do they need? Do they need to be drowned with liters and liters of fluid? No, just like 30 mils per kilo for um, sepsis. Why should 30 mils per kilo? Well, it's a magic number that's there's zero evidence base for 30 mils per kilo. So again, let, let's look at the patient and be more considered. We've definitely, yeah. Okay, so in, clo in closing to all of this, I think you can sum up our last 30 minute discussion on the fact that sometimes in intensive care, less is more, given yeah. less antibiotics, less this, less drugs, so on and so forth. Um, Professor Singer, it's always a pleasure. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you all our listeners. You can post your questions later on. And if I see them again, I'll ask them for you. All right, take care, everyone. Thanks, Adrian. Bye, everyone.